welcome. Thank you very much. If you guys could just take a seat. And for the residents out there, I'm reminded to let you know to sign both sign-in sheets if you want to get credit for something like that. Um, welcome to the Mailman Center Grand Rounds and uh, to the special Grand Rounds that's hosted by the Lifespan IPC. We're thrilled to invite uh, one of my mentors from medical school, uh, Dr. Christopher Hanks, to speak to us about uh, autism, about transition, and about the excellent clinical endeavor that they've ten undertaken at Ohio State. Uh, Dr. Hanks did his undergraduate studies at the University of Utah. He then did his medical degree at uh, Penn State University College of Medicine, and then went on to do a MedPeds residency at the Ohio State Wexner Center. Um, and then afterwards stayed on to do a year of uh, chief year in internal medicine uh, and has since joined faculty. He's an assistant clinical professor uh, and he runs the CAST program, which is, let me make sure I say it right, um, the Center for Autism Services and Transition. And he's going to tell us about their experience working with uh, young men and women transitioning to adult uh, models of care at his clinic. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Hanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thanks for the kind of introduction, and it's an honor to uh, be able to come down and join you guys today. Bear with me. My voice will gradually go out as I talk. Um, I'll be sipping from time to time, uh, but it does that. <clears throat> um, so uh, it's always kind of a question of where to start and how to begin, but um, I'm honored to be here. I will say that um, I have a lot of content, but I'm happy to pause at any point. If there's a question, please raise your hand, yell out. I, I don't mind being interrupted. Um, or I'll make sure I have, we have some time for questions at the end as well. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I, I do want to thank uh, Bill and Marcy and Ingram, who are the source of funding for the program I run, CAST, which uh, Dr. M mentioned. Um, and uh, I'm not going to read my learning objectives, but, but I, what I hope to talk about is talk about my experience um, in caring for adolescents and adults with autism as they move into the adult healthcare settings. Talk a little bit about <clears throat> kind of how we got where we are, what we've learned from what we've done so far, and where things still need to go, because there's still a long ways to go. Um, <clears throat> before I get into uh, the meat of the talk, let me just kind of address, well, how did I get into this? As, uh, you know, I don't know <laughs> is probably the best answer. Um, but um, throughout my medical training, it became very clear that there were many patients, not just with autism, but many other conditions that struggle in medical settings. Uh, particularly as they move from pediatric care to adult care, there's a lot of changes in the culture and the structure. Um, there may not be correlative specialties in the adult setting that there are in the pediatric setting. And so we see a lot of patients struggle. And as I came into my practice, uh, as a uh, primary care doctor, I said, boy, I'd love to be able to create a little bit of a niche and kind of work on this in some way or another. And luckily for me, the opportunity came up uh, in autism and it's been a, a great opportunity. I did not come into practice with any special training in autism. Um, I'm a primary care doc doctor. Uh, you know, I'm boarded in internal medicine and pediatrics. Um, and I did a one month behavioral and developmental pediatrics, you know, rotation during my you know, residency. And that was my entirety of, you know, autism training. Um, and so <clears throat> by no means was I, or perhaps am I an expert, but, but I've been learning on the job. So the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit of background on, you know, what, what's the care for people with autism or other uh, disabilities like um, currently. And so this is, this is a survey done up in Delaware, uh, mostly surveying family practice and primary care doctors, asking them, you know, about their comfort in caring with patients with different conditions. Um, and as you can see, uh, you know, there's some areas, asthma, hypertension, most people are comfortable with, that's the light blue bars, but you notice as you go down this slide that on the bottom end of it, uh, people are not very comfortable caring for patients with autism, cystic fibrosis, cerebral palsy, you know, spina bifida, technology dependent patients, there's a challenge here. And then, you know, probably to get into a little more detail, this, this is a, a paper published a number of years ago by a group who surveyed a lot of residents. And they surveyed pediatric residents and they surveyed internal medicine residents and asked them, hey, what's your comfort caring for patients with these different conditions in an inpatient and in an outpatient setting? I put the outpatient one here, but the inpatient looks similar. Um, and you can see that um, 
Uh, so the lighter bars are the pediatric residents, the darker bars are the internal medicine residents. And you know, the pediatric residents were more comfortable caring for autism, cerebral palsy, things like that. But still then, only about 50% were saying, yes, I'm comfortable with it. And in the uh, internal medicine residents, um, you know, for autism, for example, only about 10, 15% said I'm comfortable caring for that. And then the follow-up question they asked to that, which I didn't put the slide on here, is, um, you know, do you intend to take care of these, do you expect to be taking care of these patient populations when you go into your future practice? And the numbers for that are really quite low as well, um, suggesting that most people thought, oh, that's not going to be in my wheelhouse, I'm not going to have to deal with that. Uh, but I think, um, as we talk more, it will become clear that that's probably not the case. Um, and so, and leading into that, this is looking at prevalence data of uh, different developmental disabilities and other uh, challenges. And you can see the red line, the one that's climbing rapidly is autism. And I, I think anyone that's you know, been aware of this is, is aware that the diagnosis of autism is rapidly increasing. Um, but I think an important part of this slide to me is the timing. If you look back to when this rise in diagnosis started, it was about 20 years ago. Um, and so in the past 20 years, we've seen rapid increases in diagnosis, um, and that's led to more and more patients with autism, of course, you know, seeking services. And those patients are now reaching adult age, or many of them are in adult age now. Um, and yet there is a very se severe shortage of uh, services or supports for them. Um, and so that's kind of where I fell into where I am. So, so to back up a little bit farther, how did we get to the situation we are now in healthcare for um, individuals with autism or other developmental disabilities? It really you know, goes back to the deinstitutionalization de process. Back in the uh, you know, 40s, 50s, and back then, most people with developmental disabilities were put in state in institutions. They received their life support there. They received their medical care there. They lived there. Um, in the 60s and 70s, the public started you know, raising concerns about the, the quality of care in these settings. And so in the late 60s, leading to the 90s, we, we you know, started deinstitutionalization. Um, and the uh, institutionalized population shrank fairly drastically, moving a, what's essentially a new population into community settings. And, and this picture, I think, highlights that pretty well. Showing, this is showing the number of uh, people in state public institutions. And you can see around the 70s it started declining. And remember, this is while you know, the, the, uh, the population in the United States is not decreasing, it's increasing of the, the overall population. So, so there are more of these people and yet fewer and fewer of them are in institutional settings to where we are now. Um, now there's been a lot of good things that have come from this. Uh, moving out of institutional settings into community settings has improved adaptive behavior, improved quality of life for these people, it's increased their contact with family and others, but unfortunately it also did lead to lower quality health care. And you know, it's hard to find more recent data on this, but there is some and I'll, I'll share it with you. Um, there was one study, and this is old, this is from 1996, so, so I'm hoping things are better now, but there was a study back in 96 that showed that deinstitutionalization actually increased uh, risk of mortality uh, in these patients. Um, and the feeling was that the con contributors to this may have been everything from their cognitive and verbal limitations, lack of trained physicians, difficulty communicating with mul multiple care providers, and what they described as maladaptive behavior in office settings. And we'll talk more about this as we go, um, but I think those same barriers still exist today. Now that doesn't mean we should reinstitutionalize these patients. It means we need to improve what we're doing for them in the settings we're in now. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what the current state of healthcare for patients with autism or other developmental di disabilities is. There's, there's clearly a disparity and I wanna describe some of what that means. Um, so this is uh, looking at, the blue lines are patients with autism, the red is the general population, and you can see that for just about any medical condition you can think of, the rates are higher for those with autism than those that do not have autism. Um, now, that's probably not all because autism causes all of these. We, you know, there, there clearly is a link between autism and, and seizures, um, but when you start looking at obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol, there's no evidence really either way, but my personal opinion is a lot of these are, are probably not stemming directly from the cause of autism. They're probably stemming more from the side effects of autism, which are socialized isolation, lack, you know, lack of good work opportunities, leading to more sedentary lifestyle, leading to these health problems. Um, but regardless, they're, they're high risk for you know, poor health. 
Um, this slide was done by a group up in Canada who was looking at medical care and where they're getting medical care for uh, individuals with disability. This is focused on adults. And you can see on the, on the left-hand side of the slide, um, those with or without developmental disabilities are accessing primary care on a fairly equivalent you know, basis. Uh, but those with developmental disabilities are much more likely to be going to the emergency room and more likely to be hospitalized, despite the fact that they're taking primary care uh, the same amount as, as those without developmental disabilities. And to look into that even a little bit further, um, they looked at uh, questions regarding you know, what are they being admitted for, and there's much higher rates of being admitted for what they described as ambulatory care-sensitive conditions, things like asthma, they listed otitis media. I don't know that I've ever seen someone admitted for otitis media, so I'm not sure what to do with that data. But, um, but asthma, conjective heart failure, other, other chronic conditions that are hopefully well managed in an outpatient setting, uh, they're much more likely to be admitted to a hospital for those in the general population, suggesting that they're not getting the quality of care that they need in a primary care setting. Um, and the same thing applies for preventative health. Certainly if we can prevent you know, poor health outcomes, prior to development of them, that's ideal. And those with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities are much less likely to be getting periodic health exams, physicals. They're less likely to be getting their routine cancer screenings. They're less likely to be getting vaccines, which I don't think I put on the slide. Um, pretty much anything you can think of that, that we do for preventative care is less likely to happen for them. Um, and so, so, so that leaves us with this situation where we've got a population who is not receiving the care they need. Um, who is suffering because of it. And so we have to figure out what we can do. Um, there's a lot of barriers that are leading to this. I, I don't, you know, I could spend a two hour talk just talking about the barriers to care. Um, but, but briefly to hit on some of these, from a patient standpoint, barriers include communication difficulty. Many patients with developmental disabilities struggle to communicate in a verbal manner in the same way uh, that, that the rest of the population does. Um, and that can lead to disengagement in a lot of ways. Lock of, lack of knowledge about health and prevention. Um, again, patients with autism are, are likely often removed from the learning opportunities about health, learning opportunities about uh, preventative health and so forth. You know, many of them are described as having maladaptive behavior in clinical settings. And so, you know, they come in and they're, they're challenging and, you know, don't fit in in our normal structure. Uh, a lot of times in my mind, these maladaptive behaviors are truly adaptive behaviors where they're saying, hey, I, I, you know, something's not right for me here. Um, but you know, if you take it from the physician or the care team's perspective, they can be challenging to deal with. Fear or anxiety regarding procedures is a big challenge. Getting labs, getting vaccines, getting dental care you know, are, can all be much more challenging. And then often they've been marginalized in their health care. Uh, not malignantly, but, but it's not unusual for a person who's plenty capable of understanding what's going on, on to be kind of sitting on the side while the parent or the caregiver is the, the prime focus of conversation. And you know, we do that in pediatrics. I'm a pediatrician, you know, but I take care of adults too. You know, when I'm taking care of a six month old, of course the parent's my primary you know, contact and con you know, that I'm communicating with. But as teenagers just start getting older and more capable, we're hopefully allowing them to take a more forward role, um, but often those with disabilities remain sidelined in the conversations. So a couple of years ago, um, a, uh, a student in the College of Design at Ohio State worked with me and my group uh, to try and get an idea of, well, what, what are the challenges patients with autism are experiencing in clinical settings? Um, and so she took a group and sat them down and kind of worked through this process of talking about the entire process of seeing their doctor and ask them to rate stress levels for different steps of it. Um, and you can see on here, the higher peaks suggest higher stress levels. Um, and so, you know, so they described high stress levels experienced, particularly in the waiting room, um, and then talking, communicating with their doctors, going through treatment conversations, and even the checkout process, being stressful you know, experiences where they struggle at times. And, and she, the same, uh, design student made this slide to try and reflect their experiences of sensory overload, which many experience, where being around a busy environment like a doctor's office or something else may lead to you know, the sensation of just their head being so full of noise and sound, like, you know, being like a packed full of buzzing bees to the point where they can't concentrate, they can't focus, they can't accomplish 
things they want to. And even though they may be very able to communicate and self-advocate in the wrong setting, that ability is lost. And, uh, and so they feel like their head's going to explode instead, and, and, and they don't accomplish what they were hoping to. So that, that's a brief talk about, you know, a discussion about the patient's experience, but the physician's experience barriers to this too. Again, communication is a challenge. Doctors are well known for using jar jargon. We talk in, you know, language that, that doesn't always help our patients understand what we're doing. There's also a lack of knowledgeable care providers um, in, in caring for people with autism and other developmental disabilities. And I'm going to talk about that more in a little bit. Um, and I already mentioned, you know, sidelining the patient often results in disengagement. The cognitive and verbal limitations of the patients often hinder diagnosis. When you, you know, it's much more difficult for me to figure out why someone's uncomfortable if they can't tell me where they hurt, um, or that you know it feels difficult to breathe or something like that, and so um, it makes it more difficult. Reimbursement's a problem. Um, in Ohio, it's become a little bit better since Obamacare because most people are insured. We have Medicaid expansion, but even then, you know, uh, many physicians are unwilling to take large portions of Medicaid patients because it doesn't pay well. Um, and so, you know, often these patients may take more time, more energy, and, let re and get reimbursed less well, and so getting buy-in from physicians is hard. And time's a challenge, I already mentioned, you know, they often take more time. When I first started doing this, I blocked a lot of extra time for my patients with autism. The more I've done it, I found that I don't need that time anymore, uh, but it took me several years to get to that point where I felt that I could manage them in roughly the same amount of time I manage my, my patients without autism. And so um, getting the comfort is, is, is challenging. Uh, and there's really a lack of guidelines, standards of care for how to approach an adult with a developmental disability and what we should be doing for them. Do they need extra screenings? Do they need extra testing? So for some small populations, we have that. For Down syndrome or Williams syndrome or things like that, there are some guidelines that are pretty clear. But you take a person without autism, um, and is there something more we should be doing for them? Is there something else we should be screening for? Is there a question? Uh, yeah. If you think that's the main reason, my son is 36 years old. Mm -hmm. He's autistic. Sure. And his primary doctor is a pediatrician. Sure. Because most of the regular doctors don't want to take him because of that issue. That it takes more time. I'm, I'm very busy. I have a lot of patients. And is that the case in Ohio as well? Uh, absolutely. There, there's a lot of factors that play into that. And I, I didn't bring all my data, or I didn't put all my data on you know, the factors that are involved in why physicians do or do not transfer their patients. Um, and it sounds like you guys are working on that here too a little bit. Um, but when you ask pediatricians, why don't you send patients like your son on to an, you know, an adult doctor, it's worry about they're not going to give as good as care. You know? and, and honestly, any doctor experiences this, right? I think I'm the best doctor for my patients there is. Dr. M probably thinks the same thing. You know, we, we are all biased that way. We really put a lot of effort and time into our patients and no one wants to think, you know what, there's a better doctor for you down the road. So it's hard to let go of your patients. And I think every pediatrician experiences that, but for some of it's been more challenging and taking more effort, it's hard. Communication with those across that barrier is it's diff it's different. You know, they're not people you're necessarily working with unless you're in a small community where all the doctors know each other. In a setting like this, which is some, you know like the setting where I work in, where there's hundreds and thousands of doctors in the city, you know, you just don't know them all, and so finding that right person is hard. Um, so um, a lot of that comes down to, to experience and training. Um, Currently, you know, so you go back to the deinstitutionalization I talked about before. So the doctors that taught me mostly trained at a time when these patients were not as much in the community, right? And so they didn't train me in how to take care of these patients as much because they don't have that experience. And now I'm teaching people, and unless I take the effort to find ways to have that experience, I don't have it either. So, so there's a lack of training, there's a lack of comfort. Um, in one survey, only 36% of primary care providers reported they received even some training in autism. And, and as I mentioned at the beginning, my some training in autism, while meaningful, was by no means enough for me to feel comfortable doing what I'm doing. Um, up to 90% of general practitioners report it's difficult to provide care for this population. And at least 16% said, I don't want to take care of this population. And I experience this a lot. I, you know, I have patients that are sent to me 
that you know see doctors that I really respect and they immediately say oh autism go there you know and is that good or bad we'll talk about that but um, under recognition is a uh, is an important aspect in this you know physician comfort as well a lot of doctors under under report the number of patients with autism in their patient panel so they're seeing patients with aut more patients with autism than they think they're seeing um, in a survey uh, myself and a couple folks from around the country did recently, we surveyed residents uh, in a lot of different programs about their experiences caring for a number of different you know, childhood onset conditions, including autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, but also you know, a variety of other uh, non-developmental conditions. And um, they were equally likely to report that they've cared for a patient with Down syndrome as they had a patient with autism. However, there are about 10 times as many patients with autism out there as there are with Down syndrome. Why are they more likely to report it? We all know that you walk out, walk down the street and see a person with Down syndrome, you know they have Down syndrome. It's, you, know, you, you can see the features. A person with autism could be any one of us in the room. Um, and, and so I think a lot, you know, under recognition of their experience plays into their discomfort. They don't realize that they've actually taken care of these patients. Um, education is another important part. Uh, there are evidence, there are data to show that continuing education does improve knowledge and comfort in caring for in, uh, adults with in, uh, developmental disabilities. And exposure, in the survey I was talking about, the, the highest predictor for comfort and caring for a condition was exposure of caring for that condition, regardless of what the condition was. Interestingly, one of the things we looked at in that survey is we asked them their you know, did they have a family member, friend, something like that, that had a, you know, one of these conditions? And that was not predictive of being comfortable caring for them anywhere near as much as actually having spent some time caring for a person with the condition. So can I interrupt a second? Of course. Since Canada has universal health care, yeah. so there's no issue with payment. Expense. Sure. So do they, is there, and there are, I think, more primary care doctors per population mm -hmm. than there are in the United States? Yes. Does that make any difference in care? It probably does. It, it, I, it's hard to get a grasp on that. I, I haven't found any good solid literature on that, but Canada's, I think Canada's ahead of the United States in far, as far as their efforts for caring for people with disabilities. Um, because they have universal health care, everyone gets care. They have a very standardized process of once you reach this, reach this age, you are moving on to an adult doctor, you know, and so, so a lot of the literature on this topic comes from Canada because they have the ability to cap capture stuff on a broader scale than we do. Um, so my impression is yes, but I can't, you know, answer that more solidly than that. Um, so, so with that background, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, my experiences uh, over the past several years um, and kind of what we're doing, what we've learned, uh, what's worked and what hasn't. Um, and hopefully it'll be useful for some of you in the audience. So number one, you know, what it, you know, so we mentioned CAST, um, and I've gone through several iterations of what I think our purpose is. And this is my most recent one, and, let, and I'll explain more why as we go, but in my mind, the mission of CAST is to develop patients with autism into patients that can receive medical care anywhere within the medical system. And, and I originally started CAST not with really this vision in mind. When we started it, it was, proposed to us as these patients need someone to take care of them, which is correct. Um, but as I'll show you, in the long run, one doctor or a handful of doctors, which is what we are right now with appropriate support staff, can't take care of the massive volume of patients with autism that, are, that exist now and are coming up. No, and to say nothing of all the other patients with other developmental disabilities that also need similar style of care, uh, you know, it's just too many. Uh, before I go on, I'm going to address one more thing on that. Dr. M and I were talking about this the other night. A lot of times when we talk about transition of care into adult healthcare settings, the first thing I hear from people, anyone that's been around a place where there's a MedPeds program is, oh, MedPeds people are great for that. And we, I'm not going to argue with the fact that that's true, but there are not enough MedPeds doctors in this world to, to do all this. So it's not just a MedPeds problem. Um, it's everyone's problem. So where did we start? This started, and this slide doesn't really matter, this is just from one of my first meetings when we were talking about the concept of CAST. Um, you know, throwing out ideas and kind of throwing, you know, what do we need to be do? And um, one of the reasons to put this on there is, if you look through the, all this, the one thing that's underlined is safety. 
So um, when I when I was first approached about this and I sat down with folks and started talking about, well, what are we, you know, what do we need and what are we gonna do? The thing that kept coming up over and over and over again were safety concerns. And uh, for example, I sat down with a group of parents of patients who had emerging adults with autism um, and asked them, all right, you know, what do we need to, you know, what do we need in a clinic, you know, so that we can make this work? And the first three stories that came out were, well, my son's, you know, six foot six and 250 pounds and is going to come to your office and be aggressive. And, you know, has, uh, has been a real, you know, challenge in this way before. And so th they said to me, you need, you know, padded rooms, sensory rooms, lockdown facilities, you know, you know preventing egress, all this fancy stuff. And I was in the process of uh, opening a new office, um, which was already designed and being built. And it's the one I work in now. And it was designed to be a primary care office taking care of a wide range of adults and pediatric patients. In our office, we see everything from newborns to geriatric patients, you know, and, and there's no way I can accomplish that while I'm accomplishing what they were suggesting. Uh, I, and there was no way I was going to be able to fund all the changes to the office, that, you know, they recommended. And so we kind of had to take a step back and say, well, okay, we can't really do that, but what can we do? And I'll talk about how we did that in just a little bit. Um, but first, I want to. No, oh, I forgot I had this slide in here. This is my uh, this is my current team uh, with myself. Uh, we have uh, several doctors besides myself that are involved in caring uh, for patients in cast. We have been lucky to find a psychiatrist who spends a little bit of her time with us. It's not enough time. You can never have enough psychiatrist time. Uh, we have a social worker. We have a full time nurse that does a lot of care coordination, and then we have our typical medical office staff with medical assistants and registration staff and so forth. Um, like I said, this, this is occurring in a, a primary care office setting. There's nothing special about our office. Some of the doctors in our office take care of patients with autism, you know, a lot. Others don't. They just take care of, you know, whatever that comes in. Um, so, so, and I think there's been some benefits to that. It's allowed us to help normalize medical care uh, for our, our patients and, and provide some great opportunities for us to learn how to make it work in settings that are not specifically designed for, designed for patients with autism. Um, so going back to what I was talking about, you know, so I hear all these horror stories, they tell me all this stuff, and ultimately after we sat down and thought about it, we said, well, we can't change our office in the way they're suggesting, but what we can do is we can figure out who you are and what you're gonna struggle with before you come in and see how we can adapt our settings to you. Uh, and so the first approach we took was we developed a, what we called a pre-visit assessment where my nurse or another kind of front, front office staff that we hired, um, would call patients ahead of time and just go through a templated set of questions. And you can argue whether these are the right questions or not, but these are the rough, essentially the questions we used. Um, and so we try to get a bit of a gauge of who are they, what are their medical conditions, you know, what, what's their health like, and then you know, how do they do in medical settings? What happens when you try blood draws? What happens when you try vitals? You know, are they going to struggle in the waiting room? What's gonna, what's gonna make them succeed and what's gonna make, make it challenging? Um, and, uh, and how do they communicate? And by doing this, we, uh, do I, yeah, I do have data here coming up. Uh, but so, so we started doing this. Um, I actually did the first call myself because I wanted to see what happened um, and kind of learn from it. And then I turned it over to, to other folks and, and this worked pretty well. Pretty quickly we started to pick up on kind of themes and, and so forth um, and uh, started collecting data to, to understand what this meant. Um, and I'll talk about what we found from it here as we go. So what, with that data, my first effort at kind of research on our, our CAST population was doing a chart review after a year of taking care of patients. We opened in April 2014 doing this. A year later, we started collecting data and looking at, you know, who are our patient population and what are they experiencing so far. At that point, we had 143 patients we'd enrolled. Um, we collected a lot of different information on them. Uh, and this is a little bit of information about who they were. This has shifted a little bit since then, uh, but this is a rough idea of what our population is like. Age ranged, you know, fairly broadly. Um, some were a lot younger than our target age. We did get a handful of younger ones that, you know, once they heard something new with autism, they just thought they had to come to the new place. Um, we, we've since been changing our approach for getting new patients because I, we're not trying to target the younger population where there's, there's a large setting for good support for patients with autism, you know, down the street from us, essentially. But our mean age at the time was 20. It's now about 21 years old um, with a, most of them clustering in the kind of late adolescence and early adulthood age. Um, not surprisingly, there's a preponderance of males. Uh, that's still 
Uh, that's on, uh, in line with the, the frequency of diagnosis of autism in the US right now. Um, as I mentioned before, they have a lot of, lot of medical comorbidities. Um, most commonly, things like ADHD, anxiety. Our rate of intellectual disability in that first year was higher than the average in the nation. I think that's because those that were needing more support were the ones that were finding us most quickly. Um, and I think that's uh, balanced out a little bit since then. But, but you know, for being a young population, they're still a fairly complex population. Um, so, the, you know, I mentioned that previous assessment, and these are the things we started to learn. Um, of the ones I could pull from that first year that there were some EMR reasons I couldn't get data on all of them, that's complicated, but of the 74 that I could pull from that first year, 23% of them uh, said that there was something that was gonna make our standard approach difficult. And most of it was waiting. You know, most of it was the waiting room's really hard. If I'm sitting next to a kid that's crying or if there's a lot of hubbub around me, I'm gonna get, work, you know, I'm gonna struggle and I'm not gonna succeed. Um, noise, not liking needles, not like being touched, history of aggression, not liking the bright lights, not liking vital signs. These are all things, and, and I've, you know, anecdotally I can tell you that these are the same things that keep coming up over the past several years since we collected this data. Um, and so what did we do? We, we took that information, when they called, we put together a plan. So if a person called in and said, you know what, I really struggle in the waiting room. If I have to sit through, you know, sit in the waiting room, I'm not gonna be okay. Well, we said, well, can we bypass the waiting room? And we worked out a way to do that where the second they walked in, we would direct them to an exam room, we'd do the registration in the room, uh, and everything would be taken care of there. If they were waiting for me or the other doctors, they'd just wait in the exam room. Um, and that was our most common approach to this. There were some that we said, okay, you don't do vitals, we'll do them, you know, we won't do them when you come in. Normally we'd cycle back at the end and try as long as they were doing well. You know, talking to them, notifying them before we're touching them, which is reasonable. Had several that wanted to wait in a car until the, doc, you know, the doctor was totally ready to come. And we've had several that we've had to examine in their cars. You know, I've, I've done several car visits, um, and that's okay if we have to. Uh, some didn't like the fluorescent lights, so we turned the lights out. Luckily, we had some windows. Um, one of them, uh, we had a security guard present. We don't have a security guard at our office normally. Um, this one came to us because they'd been kicked out of the children's hospital system in, because he had been very aggressive towards the nurse, caused a concussion and a lot of injury. Um, when we talked to them, we actually felt like this wasn't gonna be a big issue. There were circumstances that led to that, but um, my office manager appropriately was concerned for her staff safety and said, you know, I wanna have a security guard here. I said, that's fine, but I don't want the patient to know they're here. Um, and so we had them around the corner available. It was honestly one of the easiest visits I ever had. The patient did fantastic, but we prepped really well for it. We'd have multiple conversations with the family. We had everything they needed to be happy. So um, the long and short of this is, using that assessment, we, we felt that we were able to successfully accommodate patients who struggle in medical settings in a way that uh, individualized their care, but did not require massive changes to office flow, stro flow or structure. Um, one of the things that happened with this is, uh, after doing this a while, my, my whole office staff just became more and more comfortable with it, and several patients that we didn't pick up on anything on a pre-visit assessment walked into the waiting room, and within 30 seconds, it became apparent to our registration staff that this is a patient that's not gonna do well out here. They would just walk, grab them, bring them back to a room, and, and stick them somewhere quieter. And so I think we, you know, we trained staff by giving them the power to, to uh, intervene on their own. Um, from this patient population, we, we also looked at, well, what's happening with their medical care when they come to us? And they're on a lot of medications. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this data, but suffice it to say, there are, you know, many of these patients are on multiple medications, most commonly being uh, psych psychotropic medications, um, uh, which, which anyone that's cared for them probably isn't surprised by that, but, but it does impact their health. On average, these patients had at least, uh, those with intellectual disability had at least three different classes of medications. They may have multiple medications within that class. Those without intellectual disability still have, you know, at least around two. Um, and we, we went through a process of trying to figure out how do we define how complex their medical regimens are. Because if you think about it, some of these patients, particularly those with intellectual disability, may struggle to manage their medical care. Um, and so there's something called a medical, medication regimen complexity index where we looked at their, you know, it takes into account how many medications, how often they have to take them, is there specific instructions for dosing, is it liquid and they have to measure and all these different things, and kind of categorizes how complex it is. 
and not surprisingly, those with intellectual disability, those with seizures, those with prior aggressive behavior were much more likely to have higher, more complex, challenging medication regimens. This is also the same population that's probably at highest risk for polypharmacy issues um, because they, they can't self-advocate uh, in the same way. This shows the same data. I'm going to move on for efficiency's sake. Um, they're on lots of medications. So, um, so, we're, so, so that was our first year, year and a half of kind of learning what we're doing in the process. I was learning how, you know, what, what else we needed. And then we started looking a little bit more future to how do we, you know, how do, what's our next steps and how do we improve this? Um, and I, you know, and I want to talk a little about opportunities and challenges we have in caring for this population. Number one is opportunities. I think the biggest opportunity we have is to prove that by providing good care, we can actually save money. Um, now, I haven't done that with my population yet, but I want to talk about someone else who has because th this is the first study I've seen that does this in the United States. Uh, this uh, a doctor named Tom Davis up with the Geisinger Health System in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. I started a comprehensive care clinic for adults with complex you know, developmental disabilities and technology dependent and things like that. Uh, about the same time I started my program, um, demonstrated this last year, and this is just published, uh, a 28% reduction in per member per month total cost of their patients by doing an intensive care coordination effort. And this was driven by solving the problems that I brought up in the beginning. They decreased hospitalization, they decreased ER visits, and in their health system they were able to decrease costs significantly. And if we can do that in a broader population, then we can then go to insurers, and this is where healthcare is going anyway, and say, look, you know, with the accountable care organizations that are being created, we need additional, you know, support to support our staff so that we can save you money um, in the long run. So, so I, I look at this as an opportunity. We are not there yet with my population because um, we're, the reason he could do this is he was in an uh, integrated health system where all the patients they were seeing are on the same health plan. And so it's easy to get this data. I don't have that, so I need more patients. Um, lots of challenges. Patient volume I'm gonna talk about here in just a second. Uh, we can't keep up with the number of patients we have. Um, Forever Care I put on here. Recently we've gone through this process of really exploring, you know, what are the patients and families wanting and what are the doctors that are involved in the care wanting. And patients want what they describe as forever care. They want to come and see a doctor and, and everything's going to be taken care of by that person for forever. Um, unfortunately with the volume problem, that, that's one of the challenges we're facing. Um, when you look at medical transition literature, and um, if you've looked at this, there's different assessments, there's different tools that are out there, and these are not bad tools. I've used them quite a bit, but many of them aren't well suited for patients with intellectual disability or autism who struggle to communicate or, or who have specific needs. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the challenges we have to work on. And then the unknown. Um, I still don't know everything. I'm still learning. Uh, as, as time goes on, we discover more. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, as I mentioned, volume's a problem for us. Uh, we've been open since April 2014, so we're almost four years in. Uh, I have never done any advertising. I have done no efforts at all to recruit patients, and yet I keep growing at a really steady rate. So we're up to almost 600 patients in our program now, uh, and there's, there's certainly no end in sight. And these patients, once they, once they come to us at 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, it's not like pediatrics where there's an end point you know, of age. The end point is, you know, many, many years from now. So, so we have to figure out how do we manage this growing population that isn't going to go away. Do you have um, an idea of what your population would be if, if you did 100%? I mean, that's your, yeah. that's your top. Well, so what, um, what theoretically, so, so we've tried to query this, and, and it's really hard data to get, actually. Um, theoretically, we know that autism is being diagnosed currently at a rate of 1 in 68 in the, in the nation. There are somewhere around the order of 4 million people in the Columbus metropolitan area. That's a whole lot of patients. Uh, you know, do all of them need the specialized care we're offering? Probably not. And one of the things we've learned from what we're doing is, you know, when you go back to the, the assessment data we did, and when, we look, when I've gone through our patients and reviewed how complex their care is, what we're seeing is probably about 20% are highly complex, really needs support and, and uh, and extra services in a, in a medical care setting. Another 20% on the other end of the bell curve really fit into the standard system pretty well and don't need a lot of support. And then there's that gray zone in the middle, and we're still trying to figure out how do we 
direct them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, so I mean, it, I don't have a number, but it's huge. And it's not getting smaller. That's the answer I can give you. And you can see the rate of increase here is not really slowing. You know? And if we advertise, I guarantee we could fill up even more quickly. This is our number of visits with, with the different providers. One of the things that happened is after several years of doing this, one of the docs that I brought in originally uh, was mostly based at a different office and was struggling with the challenges of moving back and forth between the two offices. And, and, and she said, hey, can I move my patients you know, in cast to my other office? Uh, which was a great experience for us. We, you know, we said, yeah, that's a great idea. We'd love to spread out. Um, she was working in an office that I had worked in prior to the one I'm in now. It's a whole bunch of MedPeds docs. It, you know, they take care of all sorts of patients with disabilities as well as the, the general population. But the second we said we were gonna do this, the doctors and the staff there freaked out. They were scared to death about the same things that came up when we started of, you know, how are we gonna manage them? You know, what are we gonna do? And so we had to go train the docs that I thought were the, the best possible option and the staff supporting them on how we do it. And, and, and that's been a great learning experience for us as we look towards helping train other doctors. Yes? Have you had a chance Absolutely. And so, did you notice any difference in the process? Um, so, it's a great question. So, yeah, we, we did the same process with them. So, if they called in, we would do an assessment with them with just them instead of their parent. Um, and it was, you know, I, I think the people doing the assessments had to, to tweak their question approach a little bit. But ultimately, we still found the same things. So, you know, some of them said, yeah, I still really struggle with this, or, you know, blood draws I'm going to hate. Most of them that were self advocating navigated the, the system pretty well. Um, and so, so then we started trying to de develop tools and, and explore this more. I think from a time standpoint, I'm not going to show these videos, but, but one of the things we did is we got a grant from Autism Speaks and have put together a few videos. This is our website. Um, but in the patient resources section, we, we've done videos for some of the common procedures that patients are struggling with. So if they're struggling with a blood pressure or if they're struggling with a blood draw, this is an opportunity for them to watch this, watch the entire process ahead of time. We're working on tip sheets that will go to both families as well as to um, medical providers to kind of talk through, here's some of the things you can do to make this more successful. One of the, one of the nice things about this, um, so we used uh, this gentleman that you see here, Max, uh, it, he has autism. Um, he had never had a blood draw before, he'd never had an EKG before, he'd had a blood pressure check before. And he was kind enough to volunteer, well, he was volunteered by his mother <laughs> and agreed um, to go through this. And, and so we got to you know, develop this using him as our model. Um, and uh, so I, I think you know, sometimes it's just a matter of developing comfort. I was talking with a gentleman a little bit before. Um, you know, there's not much literature on how do we help patients with autism succeed in these settings. The best literature is from the dental literature. And they clearly have some studies out there showing that you can go through a desensitization process and become comfortable and get, accomplish, you know, cavity fillings and stuff like that without sedation in many patients. Now, you know, there are some that may need, you know, sedation and other things, but um, so we're trying to model after that. And we've had success with this. We've had some patients that really, you know, we couldn't get blood draws and, you know, we brought, we send them home with tourniquets to practice. We'll send them home with other stuff, you know, everything we can. Uh, we, you know, they have the video to look at. We've even had some that we bring in, you know, weekly or monthly f over the course of a long time to just meet with the nurse and try, see how far we get, come back, try, see how far we get to the point where we finally succeeded with some of them. And so I think, I think one of the things that many patients uh, with disabilities experience is trauma in medical care. Um, you know, so you come in and you need a blood draw, what do we do? Same thing we do for a newborn when they need vaccines, we hold them down, you know. And that's a traumatic experience. And just like with newborns, you know, once you're starting to give vaccines to your 15 month old, they already know what's coming and they're laying on the table screaming before those vaccines show up. Uh, the same thing happens with an adult that's been through these similar experiences. And so if we can make it a less scary experience and teach them that, you know what, you can handle this, uh, that creates success where we're working again towards that concept of can they get care anywhere. Um, and then our most recent efforts have been, uh, we, so, so the, the, the person in the college that designed that did those earlier slides talking about the stress levels in medical care, along with a couple other folks in her, um, uh, her department, 
coupled with us on a recent project that we're just finishing up. And this data, honestly, I'm still working through. And so some of this we, we haven't made much movement on yet. Uh, but they, uh, they, they joined with us and we, we got some grant money and, and did an, tried to do a really in-depth assessment looking at what the current process is in healthcare, going, you know, transitioning from the children's hospital to us, um, and what should the future ideal you know, transition process look like, and how do we get to a care anywhere type of concept. And also went out to our community general practitioners and said, what do you need to take care of this population? Because when I look at our rapid increase in growth, and the volume that we're dealing with. In the long run, we're gonna to have to channel many of these patients out to the general practitioners throughout the community. Um, and that's, that's the only way we will successfully care for all these patients in the future. Um, so they, this is just kind of a mapping of who they sat down with. They sat down with parents, patients with autism, uh, a number of different uh, physicians and other care providers in both the pediatric and the adult care settings. Um, and kind of did this iterative process of collecting information, creating stuff, having the next group look at it and modify and tweak and, and develop. And so that they, they described it as a co-design or participatory design process. Um, trying to identify what are the must-haves, what do we really need, what, what would be nice, and what, what if we could do would be game changes that would make this work really well. Um, and what we learned is we start, you know, where are we now? We're really in this kind of linear, you know, transfer process of they're taken care of by the pediatric folks, whoever that may be. And where do I get most of my patients? So they're either referred from the, uh, excuse me, behavior and developmental pediatrics or community pedi pediatricians that have heard about us over time. And they're sent to us and they stay with us and we've got them. But as I mentioned, you know, we've got, we know that 10 to 20% are gonna need long-term high, highly intense care. There's another section that you know, probably could go anywhere, and then there's the gray area in between. Um, and so, so this is where we started. And then, you know, through this process, we, you know, we, they kind of started to break it down into different dimensions of how do we work on, you know, patient care, patient-centered care, how do we work on education and outreach, and how do we, you know, approach the level of support and independence that, that, that patients need. Um, and I'm brushing over this, I realize, because of a time standpoint, but if people have questions, I can answer more. And from that, they then you know, put together, and you can't read this probably because it's too small, but a whole lot of different areas of, you know, these are future opportunities, things we can work on. And so, so then we've gone to what our current transition map is, which is the top part here, and then our future ideal transition map, which includes a time of uh, co-management between the pediatric and the adult provider, where there's, there's an overlap of care so that it, you know, things don't fall through. Uh, and then a time of developing skills and abilities and working on things, and then hopefully a good number of patients trans transitioning out of our care onto other providers, uh, but some staying with us. Um, and there's all, all these little boxes or different areas, things we plan to work on or hope to work on over time. Um, with this, we've developed a new um, kind of, uh, we've developed some new tools, and I'll show you an example of one of them here in a second, to assess current skill levels and put together plans of how to build it and so this is our we've just started doing this honestly in the last month so I don't have any great experience from it but so so we moved that uh, pre-visit assessment that used to be by phone we've moved it to an in-person assessment for most of our patients with a social worker one of the reasons we do this honestly is money um, as I mentioned money is a challenge paying for all our staff is a challenge social workers can bill for their time you know we can make money but also I've gotten better assessments for most patients by having them in person where she can sit down with them see them and and, and see them. So they meet with the social worker, she does an intake assessment, provides a lot of great information, which saves time for me when I see the patient, and also, I think, streamlines the process. And she can start addressing needs immediately if they have community needs, she can start addressing them before they're even seen by the doctor. They're seen by a doctor, and then they go into kind of a cycle of seeing, you know, seeing the doctor for medical care, and, and also working on kind of transition assessments and goal settings, and, and so, forth, so forth with the social worker. So they're having multiple touch points per year, um, and hopefully making progress. And so we've developed some tools. This is an example of one. For those of you that have looked at transition literature, there's a lot of transition assessments out there. And as I mentioned, most of them don't really, uh, they don't target the development of the disabled population very well. Um, and uh, and we, we felt like we needed something different. We also wanted to develop something that we hope over time we can then as you know used to send on to future medical providers say i decide that all right we're now ready to transfer you out to a, a different primary care doctor 
I want to be able to send them a summary that says, this is what they do independently with no trouble, and these are the accommodations they may need to make this successful that should be fairly easy for most doctors. And so this looks at kind of through all aspects of managing health and allows us to you know, assess where they're at and then hopefully make goals to work on and, and you know, cycle through with the social worker. So this is what we're working, working on now. Um, and we're hopeful that this will help us move the next step forward. Now, I, I've talked about a lot of stuff here. Like I said, I could, you know, I could talk for hours, honestly, but I'm gonna stop there uh, and say that, you know, what have I learned, just to summarize, what have I learned from this process? I've learned, um, number one, that anyone can do this because I walked into this really blind um, and honestly, my first 50 patients or so, I, I think I told every single one of them, I said, you know what, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm gonna learn from you as much as you learn from me. And I never had a patient upset about that. Um, and I think a lot of them appreciated it. And, and if we can take that approach and, and step back and, and accept that we don't know everything, but we can figure it out, uh, we can. Um, number two is, as I said, this can't be done by a couple doctors. Uh, this can't be done by a couple social workers. You know, this has to be something that eventually becomes community-wide efforts. Um, and to do that, we need to expose our medical students, our residents, and our current doctors to opportunities to care for these patients. Uh, and that's a lot of my effort right now um, as I go around and talk and as I work in my division. Just this last week, I had, I think, three or four different doctors in my uh, division reach out to me saying, hey, I've got this patient with autism, but I'm starting to think I might actually be able to take care of this one. Can you just tell me what to do about this and this and this? And I cheer that so loud that, you know, it, that, that's my dream. Um, I'm going to pause there. I could, like I said, I could keep talking for forever, but let me answer questions because we're probably running out of time. Yes? Uh, I just have uh, brought, the, brought that up where it's hard to take blood, blood work. Mm -hmm. So for patients like my son who's traumatized by it, um, how do you get around that? Because there's a population that, like mm -hmm. uh, my nephew's autistic. Okay. And it's just a setting. Mm -hmm. like, he won't do it at his doctor's office, but if you go on the car, he'll see his mark, okay? Mm -hmm. But my son is just traumatized by it, okay? So, I mean, is it a sedation, the answer? Well, so, you know, are there some patients that may, might always need sedation? That's possible. I, I, you know, I honestly can't answer that question, but, but my belief is that most do not. Um, and you know, what I can tell you is, so you know, we've, been, we've been doing those efforts for several years now with this. Uh, when I first started, the first year or so, I, you know, I held patients' arms really tight. You know, I would clamp them down and have my staff would come in and draw their blood, and it was awful. It was terrible. And then I had someone, you know, educate me. Um, and so, but, you know, like I said, we, we currently, you know, when I'm ready to try, uh, you know, and, and number one, I never do this on the first visit. First visit is all about, let's get you comfortable in our office. It might be the sixth or seventh or eighth visit before we even talk about a needle, depending on the patient. It might be the first if they say, hey, no big deal, let's go for it. Um, but it starts with, we go in and we see how far we can get. And that normally means my medical assistant walks in with all the equipment and if it's, we can't even get a tourniquet on you, okay, well here, here's a tourniquet. You're gonna take it home, you're gonna play with it, you're gonna practice putting on your arm, you know, the family or the, if they've got a behavioral uh, analyst that works with them, you know, can work on these things and develop comfort. And then they come back and we try again. And if we can get the tourniquet on, all right, then, well then the next step is let's clean your arm and we're gonna work on that for a little bit. And then the next step is I'm actually gonna uncap this needle. And normally that's where the patients freak out. Um, and but I can tell you, we had one that it, it took about 15 visits with my nurse until that needle actually touched its arm. And several more before we actually got blood. I'm gonna ask you about one question. Yeah. Which is, um, why do we have to draw blood? Say a that. A lot of times, I, sure. I know that it's because it says it in the book, or mm -hmm. I mean, me personally, um, I won't let anybody, so I will admit that X-Files they have my blood, you know, okay, inappropriate. Yeah. But I'm always trying to get my doctor to explain to me why you know that. What is it you're mm -hmm. going to tell me? And I think it's been 10 or 15 years other than I donate blood. Okay. It's not about yeah. needles. It's I don't understand why they need it. What's going sure. to change my health care? Okay, so, so this is a great question. You're right. We don't always need blood. Um, 
if you're, you know, I think there, but we do eventually have a circumstance in life where we probably need blood, right? So at some point in your life, you will need blood drawn. That is not the time to discover we can't draw your blood, okay? Um, so if we can teach you to allow blood draws when they're needed, you're right. Do I need blood? Do I need to check someone's cholesterol every year, especially a 20 year old? Good heavens, no. Now, insurance plans might tell me to, but I don't care. Um, the same thing goes with, you know, so we could talk about pap smears for women. If they've never been sexually active, you could argue that, well, why on earth do we need a pap smear? And, you know, and if they're otherwise doing fine, why do we need a pelvic exam? But what if they start having horrendous pain or menstrual bleeding you know, that's uncontrolled and we need to do that exam and we can't that day? I've had this happen with women. I've had testicle you know, swelling that I couldn't examine in a man. And I quickly realized that if I don't do a process of getting them comfortable with this, then when the emergency happens, I can't address it. And so that's why. Yes. I absolutely love this. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out, I went to from a time when I was younger. So I have a phobia with sure. knee So what I, I tend to freak out, cry. Mm -hmm. Actually, cry now. <laughs> and then the next day, blind flow. Mm -hmm. For them to give me the knee. Yeah. I cannot be in the room with the knee. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. so I have to figure out that by myself, mm -hmm. what do I need to, to get over that factor? Uh, and I love that. So, for, you know, because I'm sure the microphone didn't pick that up, and, and I think we're videoing. Let me recap. She said that she has cerebral palsy and that she was traumatized in the past getting blood draws, and so now she's learned that if she goes in blindfolded, she can tolerate it because she doesn't have to see the process. And I think the most, the thing that I can generalize to everyone on that is. The first thing any medical provider should do when approaching someone is say, how do we make this work for you? Right. And, and that's what our pre-visit assessment taught me is if you ask them, how do I make my office work for you? Normally you can figure it out. If that's, you know, boy, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just so many examples. White coats, I hate white coats. We have patients say that from time to time. Luckily no one in my office wears a white coat, so it's not an issue. Um, you know, but, but whatever it may be, surely there's some way we can figure out how to make this work. Have I had to try blood, draw blood in a car before? Yeah. You know, my office is a first floor office. You can walk out the parking lot and do it. Yeah, we you just have to figure these things out. We have to, you know, there, when you look at disability models, and I'm sure many of you in, in the audience are familiar with this, there's the, there's the medical model of saying, all right, you're disabled and, you know, it just sucks for you essentially. Or there's the model of saying, well, you know, what's the social model of disability? It's that, our society isn't supporting you in the way we need to. And in many cases with autism, with other developmental disabilities, the environment is not built to support you. How can we change the environment? Um, and, and often it's not as hard as we think it is. Yeah. So a lot of the transitions, there are a lot of transition tools out there. I found that the mm -hmm. challenge that I've had with my patients with cognitive disability and autism is that in general, you try to fill out this you know, evaluated transition Mm -hmm. Right, and and so when you're building a tool for this particular patient population, do you find that it's actually readiness of the patient, or is this more preparing the provider that's going to accept them sure. to kind of know how to work it? Because I, I don't I don't think readiness of the patient is necessarily what's going to work for this problem. So so I agree with you, and I struggled with it for a long time. I I go to transition meetings several times a year. I talk with all the people that built these assessments. I've argued with them about this over and over and over again. Um, and I, I, I started this practice and I was using them for most of the patients, and like here, fill this out, here, fill this out, and logging and putting all this information in. And I quickly found that I didn't know what to do with the information. You know, it's like, okay, well, we know you're not there. Now what? And you're like 30 years old. Right. And so, yes, I don't <laughs> And so, so, but, you know, what I did find is, in many cases, that questionnaire was the stem to lead to all right, family, let's start figuring out what we can address in these things. And I can't fix it, but you know, if your child is able to get through school and do these things, he's probably able to refill his medications. And he's probably able to schedule his appointment if we work on it. And it's a lot better to do that now than when you're 30 and suddenly show up in a doctor's office unsupported. 
you know, the way we developed our tool, and you can't really read it because it's too, you know, it's kind of washed out because this is a new thing and I didn't have a fancy copy of it. Um, you know, it's, the, the columns are, you know, the columns are, I can do this myself, I'm learning, or I need help, right? Um, and then the idea being, I need help, well, what is that help? You know, so that we can then hopefully take this tool and say, you know what, for this patient, they can do a blood draw if you do this, this, this. And we can give that to the family, the provider, to everyone, and they can know. Or they can handle a blood pressure, but don't do it the first thing you do when they walk in the room. Wait to the end. You know, and so, so yeah, I completely agree with you that these tools, they're validated. What are they validated in? They're validated for internal consistency. Um, there is no validation saying that they improve long-term outcomes. That hasn't been studied yet. They haven't been using them long enough. Um, and so, the place I used them most before we built this, and I honestly, this one's done by my social worker, and, and we've, I think she's done one so far, because we really, this, we got this last week. <laughs> um, when I have parents that are really overbearing, uh, that I feel like the patient could better advocate for themselves than they are, a lot of times that's when I pull out a transition assessment to say, hey, look at these things. What can we start shifting over? Or, boy, I really want next visit for your son, to bring this set of questions and talk to me instead of you talking to me. And that's a great tool to do that conversation, but that's how I use them. This is totally anecdotal and no evidence behind what I just said. <laughs> I can talk to the client, can talk to the patient instead of talking to the mother, or whoever comes in with them, ask yes. them that same question. You know, make sure that you ask them the same, that you reword your question. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that they understand the Exactly. Question. Yes. We have to rely on kind of that, yes. that yeah, yeah. triangle of communication yeah. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you.